Please, Dato, please welcome Win Morasaki. He plays show, Philip Zhao. From Rogue One to Ready Player One, he is Nolan Sorrento, Ben Mendelsohn. She plays Helen, Lena Waif. Samantha, played by Olivia Cook. Wade Watts, Ty Sheridan. The screenwriter of Ready Player One, Zach Penn. And the author of the New York Times bestseller, Ready Player One, please give it up for Ernest Kai. Now, okay, you are all going to see this movie next week, Thursday night, May 28th. You're gonna read reviews, you're gonna hear people talking about social media everywhere, but there's only one review that really does matter for Ready Player One, Ernest Klein, that is yours. What did you think of the film? Uh, I'm biased, but it's my favorite Steven Spielberg movie ever. <laughs> now, Okay, so how much when you were writing the book, back to when you were sitting in front of your computer, your laptop, you know, whatever floats your boat, maybe you're still running from a notepad, how much did Steven Spielberg really inspire you with the genesis of the story? Uh, well, a huge amount. Um, you know, I grew up uh, watching his movies, and uh, uh, Close Encounters was life-changing, and then a few years later, Raiders of Lost Ark. Also life-changing for me, E.T. Uh, was the same age that Elliot was uh, when that movie came out, so it uh, just that became my favorite movie of all time. His, you know, uh, like I say in that video, his his work is kind of built into my uh, DNA. And when I was writing Ready Player One, he was definitely uh, a big inspiration. Just the kind of overall tone of the Amblin movie that I wanted to capture of a kid, you know, or a group of kids in kind of. Uh, downtrodden circumstances who uh, get carried off on a fantastic adventure. You know, that was the kind of story like the Goonies or E.T. Uh, that I was trying to, to, to capture. And you know, the, the uh, Ty's character, uh, character uh, Wade Watts, he carries a grail diary through the whole book, you know, to collect his uh, clues from the treasure hunt. Um, he drives a DeLorean from Back in the Future, so it would have been a different book if, you know, if it wasn't for Steven and his films. You know, it's interesting, you, know, you think about the around 32 movies that Spielberg directed, and then there are the movies that he produced, like you mentioned, like The Goonies, Gremlins, Back to the Future, uh, Poltergeist, it's really, really astounding. So, being such a massive fan, what was, the, what was the first conversation that you had with him about directing this movie? Uh, well, it, it was, uh, it was the, one of the biggest days of my life, you know, uh, uh, and I think that that's the thing, when anyone goes to meet Steven, um, he's probably used to this because for the past 30 years, whenever someone comes to meet him for the first time, you know, they just had a haircut and their wardrobe is overthought and they're kind of trembling. And um, uh, and uh, so that was how I felt when I went to meet him. I've since said, you know, it felt like being Charlie Bucket, you know, with his golden ticket, like standing outside the gates of the chocolate factory. Uh, and when you go in, you know, like you pass this uh, uh, wishing well that's uh, featured in Back to the Future as you go in and then there's a velociraptor inside. It's like going, you know, going into this magical place like Skywalker Ranch, you know, a place where I had imagined my whole life, and it was, you know, all these, uh, uh, all these dreams from my childhood were made in this place, so it was amazing, I, you know, uh, uh, he's so good at setting you at ease, and, you know, because uh, you're, <laughs> so many people are probably freaking out when they meet him, he's really good at letting you know he's just a person, and, and once we started to talk about movies, then I calmed down, and I was able to, you know, communicate with him, uh, uh, and I, I, we, uh, one of the first things that uh, we talked about was uh, the race scene and uh, how we were going to get to include the DeLorean time machine, uh, which uh, was my cue to bring out my DeLorean glove box lid that I had brought with me to Amblin, so he would autograph it uh, for me. So I still found moments to geek out, even though we were getting to collaborate. Embrace it, you know, be a fan. I, I, I can't help it. You know, Zach Penn is the screenwriter of movies like X2, Ooh, yeah. uh, Incredible Hulk, Avengers. Now, now these being based on Marvel superheroes, comic books, you know, Ready Player One is a lot more dense than a 32-page comic. What kind of uh, collaborations did you have in capturing the spirit of the book, Ready Player One? 
Well, um, Ernie and I actually met before I started writing. I did this documentary about uh, digging up the E.T. video games in the desert called Atari Game Over. That's a great movie. Um, uh, and Ernie was in the movie. In fact, he was kind of the star of the movie. My producers kept saying, more Ernie, more Ernie. Um, it was a documentary, so that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but whatever. Um, but so, you know, from the very beginning, even before I started writing, I was already talking to Ernie about, well, here's what I'm thinking, and how are we going to deal with this? And, you know, Ernie even said to me, we got to change the challenges. We need something that's more cinematic. You know, how about a race? So, so that makes it a lot easier when, and in general, it makes it a lot easier to write when the author and the creator of the universe and then the director, who is kind of the creator of our universe, are all kind of working together instead of at odds, which I hate to say it is often how other movies are made in Hollywood. Uh, it's a lot easier to adapt, you know, because it's like, I have the author right here. And he approves of this moment that we created. So it was just, for my end, it was the best collaboration uh, uh, experience of my life. Because first of it, first working with Zach, it's like, getting to work with one of my friends and somebody who had helped inspire me when I was writing Ready Player One. Zach wrote Last Action Hero, which uh, helped inspire the flick sinks in my book. And I snuck the Last Action Hero. I was Hero. just a kid when I wrote it when I was yeah, When he was just starting out. But, um, but that whole idea of going into one of your favorite movies and using your knowledge of the movie genre to navigate and survive, that uh, he was one of the people who helped inspire that. So that was really cool for me to get to work with him and, and somebody who I'd become friends with. And then uh, once Steven came on board, then it was, you know, like two friends getting to, you know, work with one of their heroes. Uh, it was it was a great experience. Well, I think it's safe to say that everyone on this panel, in one way or another, we've all been inspired by different Spielberg movies over the years. Whether you're, you know, a little like older like me, so it's Jaws and Close Encounters, or maybe if you're younger, it might be like Jurassic Park or or Ben Harvard Report. But I just want to go down the line because we are Brother Cotton, and it's all about being a fan. So Ty, we'll start with you. What is your favorite Spielberg movie and just go right down the line. Your favorite Spielberg movie. Favorite Spielberg movie of all time has got to be E.T. Olivia. Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. Ooh, no. Temple of Doom! Right. Underbreed. Okay, help. Um, I, could be, I could be cliche and say The Color Purple, which is one of my favorite movies, but I'm going to go with uh, Jurassic Park. Ben. Indiana Jones. Which one? The first one, Daddy. Raiders. <laughs> Next, yes. The Avengers of Tintin. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, uh, for me, catch me if you can. Wow. Woo! Two. All right. How about you win? Thank you. Sorry? Uh, he, he just gave me. Oh, okay. Right, right at the end. Uh, here's my translator. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 he still, he still have a favorite Spielberg. I didn't see Spielberg. Oh, but, you know, I, I like Jurassic Park, though. There we go. Okay. <laughs> That's my translator. Yeah. Okay, so now, tell me about, uh, let's, let's start back with you, Wynn, and your interpreter. Okay, yes. so the first time you met Steven Spielberg, what was that like? Uh, I met him uh, in a second audition in LA, and I was like, I was so nervous, and he was so warm, and uh, I felt like uh, he was like my grandpa. <laughs> A young, handsome yeah. grandpa. <laughs> yeah, I mean, every morning he hugs us. So, culturally, we don't hug each other in Japan. So, that was my first time to hug the director. The director, you know. Yeah. Come on. Oh, I, I met him when we were filming our mocap. I was in my uh, tight mocap suit, and we were just standing around on set, and then he just walks in. I'm like, oh god, is that Steven Spielberg? <laughs> and then Wynn gives me this, like, this little nod. I'm like, okay, okay, got it, okay. <laughs> I can deal with this. <laughs> okay, now, you know, Ben, you know, you're, you, by the way, Darkest Hour. What? Fantastic. <laughs> Co-star Gary Oldman, Oscar winner. But you go from Rogue One to Ready Player One. Yes, yes. The first time I met Stephen was at a little French restaurant. It was just the two of us. He had a hard time looking at me for a long time. You know, he was shy. Um, he was starstruck. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't want to. Yeah. He's so handsome. Maybe. 
I know he's from Bloodline, and I know he was very affected by that on a lot of levels. And, um, you know, eventually he sort of relaxed enough to talk, and then, you know, he made his offer. And I said, Stephen, I'll think about it, mate. I'll think about it. I'll get back to you on that. And, uh, and then, you know, we talked over a long, long time. I had a lot of things that I wanted to clear up before I would sign on. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm talking a little bit of Yang, but, yeah. you know. Uh, it was all right. It was all right. <laughs> Well, for, for Lee and for Olivia, for Ty, you know, when you're working, you know, you, you meet Spielberg and say, my God, this is Spielberg, but then you really start working with him. So I wonder if we could each start with you, Lena, the first scene that he directed you in, what was that like? And what was it, by the way? Uh, first scene, I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll say this, uh, I'll just say my character gets a clue, and she, the way she celebrates is through dance. <laughs> or freestyle dance. Uh, so that was the first thing that I had to do for Mr. Spielberg was show off my dancing moves. And I did that. And um, and I'm very happy with how it turned out. Uh, no, but like Steven's so great. Like he obviously gives you very specific direction because he has a very clear vision of what his movies should look like and what he wants. But he's also cool about leaving space for you to kind of find your own thing in it, which is really nice. So yeah, that's the first thing he directed, he directed me. Olivia. Um, the first scene he directed me on it was with um, Mark Rylance as well and we're in motion capture and uh, we're wearing the very tight suits and we've got dots all over our face and the head comes on and I was trying to do this very nuanced performance I was trying to really impress and um, Stephen came up to me and he said um, you're gonna have to be a bit bigger than that because I, I can't see what you're doing and I was like oh, okay Stephen that's okay yeah. <laughs> sorry Stephen because like Ernie said you try to impress so much yeah. how about you Ty? Um, the, uh, the first time I ever, the first day we worked together, we were, it was actually during rehearsal, and uh, he, because he doesn't like to do rehearsal, we were there two weeks before, kind of getting familiar with motion capture, and he shows up on the Friday before we're going to shoot on the Monday, and he tells everyone to go home, and he wants to shoot with me, and I'm like, oh no, boy, I didn't know, oh, well, I didn't know we were going to shoot today, that's uh, and so he's like, yeah, I just want to capture you walk in. I want you to do like the John Travolta walk from Saturday Night Fever. Okay. Cool. So I'm just standing there across uh, on one end of the motion capture floor. He's on the other, and it's just me and him, and I'm waiting for him to call action, but he's not saying anything. And, uh, and then he pulls out his phone, and he starts playing this song. He starts playing Stayin' Alive by the Bee Gees. <laughs> and then he starts walking towards me, and he's nodding in his head, and he's just staring at me. And I'm like, and he goes, and action. <laughs> now, the, the movie like this, you know, you've got the reality and you've got your avatars. So, I guess really, not only what were the challenges of playing, you know, your real characters versus playing your avatars, but, you know, for a lot of people who may not really understand the actual process of performance capture, you know, I was wondering if you could just like, take us through that. Let's start with you, Lena. Uh, it's, well, none of us had ever done it before, so we looked online at YouTube videos of behind the scenes footage of Avatar. <laughs> if any of you have ever done that before, that's pretty much what it is. It's like, we're in these suits with a lot of dots on them, and like she said, we have helmets on with cameras on them, capturing our facial expressions. Different colored crotches. Okay, that's true. As well. I think mine was tangerine colored. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and the thing is, it's like we have to make sure our body language matches the character, the, the, our avatar. Because like for me, H is like a six foot tall, half man, half machine, like cross between. Taller than six feet. foot. How, how, how tall is he? Eight. 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 Seven foot? Okay. Oh, you guys determine how tall. Okay, Lena, by the way, Lena had a big pink doll ball on her head that was yeah. like two feet taller than her. So and you guys would look up. Yeah, when you're doing a scene with her, she says her line, and you look over, and you look, you look at her face, and you're like, I was supposed to look at the ball. Yeah, Lena's <laughs> getting so mad, and she's like, look up. Look at my torso. You're looking at my mechanical torso. That's about how tall I am. Uh, but yeah, but the thing is, like, H has really big arms and a mechanical torso, so I have to make sure my movements reflect that. And then when the going gets tough and there's a bit of a war, I have to become Iron Giant, which is phenomenal. 
And but the thing is, Iron Giant is all iron, and he's a giant, and I'm gonna walk differently, and run differently, and fall differently. So we had amazing acting coaches on set to help us with body language, and obviously Steven was a wonderful guy. So that way, all the characters felt similar, but also a little different when you see them. I remember watching Lena, you uh, rehearse your Iron Giant walk, and what was crazy about it is you could see on the screen because uh, right there's a guy helping you. Yeah. So there were two Iron Giants, you know, walking around like Iron Giants, and like Lena slowly getting exactly walking exactly like the Iron Giant. You actually could watch it in the in the movie. You know, you could see what the set looked like, what the virtual set would look like as they were doing it. So yeah. It was pretty trippy just sitting there. It's two Iron Giants just walking around. <laughs> we all, chill, it's pretty cool. We also had a uh, Gavin and Abby and they helped us yeah. like develop our avatar movements and oh. def like, make it different from our real life people. Yeah. Well, what were some of the other things that, you know, you're making a movie like this, like, especially for, for Wynn and Philip. Yes. Like, when was the first time you were really blown away by the scope of the movie that you were working on? The first thing that really made you just go, wow. Uh, the craft services? <laughs> Right, uh, you know, this is my first time in Hollywood movie. I mean, yeah, the sets are really cool, and you know, Stephen was very nice, and he made us feel good and comfortable. And uh, <laughs> but I chose uh, craft services because <laughs> I mean, uh, we are uh, yeah, absolutely, we have a craft services in Japan, but like this big. <laughs> so in the Hollywood, like they had a track. So like I was like, oh, this is Hollywood. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was bigger than our hotel. Yes. Yeah. A lot of snacks. Yeah, Ben Mendelson. I gotta ask. Okay, you're you're awesome in Rogue One. You're awesome. Yeah. Ready, player one. What, first of all, what is it with you in ones? And, and second, most the real question is, how much do you love playing? sort of the villain, the bad guy. Why is it more fun to play the bad guy? Uh, the pay is better. When you're playing a bad guy, <laughs> oh, let's cut through it, people. You know, the pay is just so much better. If you're willing to take on the responsibility of being the bad guy, you just get paid so much more. <laughs> like, it's incredible. That's the big secret. What was the first question you asked? It got lost in this racetrack kind of like hat coming around the corner as I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's just like, what is it with you and once? Yeah, but that was, that was not really the question. I still didn't. Still didn't. No, no, sorry. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> Olivia. So, 2015 at the Sundance Film Festival, I saw a really touching movie, wonderful movie called Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. Yes. And a couple years later, this year at Sundance, I saw a movie called Thoroughbreds. So, how do you go from independent films like Me and Earl and Thoroughbreds to a big, epic film like Ready Player One? What were the challenges and what was exciting about it? Um, lots of campaigning, lots of auditions, lots of convincing people that you're worth it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, it, it, I think as long as the passion's there, it doesn't really, I mean, the budget's massive. Um, and yeah, and craft service is a lot bigger. But, um, <laughs> but I think it, yeah, I think if the passion's there, then it doesn't really make a difference how big or small the, the film is because collectively everyone wants to uh, be involved and, and do the best job possible. Certainly. You know, Ty. Uh, you know, any, any kind of movie, whether it's an independent film or just a straightforward drama or even a special effects driven epic like this one, when you have your lead actors, you, you gotta have the right chemistry, they gotta flow, they gotta be good together. So like, tell me about the first time that you and Olivia knew that you like, really had the right sort of chemistry to really like sell the character driven story like, of this movie. Well, we... Uh, I guess we had it because Stephen cast us uh, after seeing us in a room together. But um, we uh, we actually spent all all the five the high fives what they're called in the movie um, the five character. We spent two weeks 
rehearsing together and talking about this crazy experience of now, you know, now we're in a Steven Spielberg film. And, um, so we got really tight and, and close over that time. And Olivia and I were, had to rehearse this dance. We recreate this kind of famous dance from a, from a movie. And um, <laughs> so we spent like two weeks rehearsing that. And I think that's because of that. Like we got incredibly close, not only emotionally, but also physically. Uh, <laughs> All right, okay. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Just while we were dancing. Just while we were dancing. Hmm. Yeah, I want to take it up, uh, take some questions from the audience in a few minutes. So there's a microphone right in the back here. So make sure you line up and, uh, you know, get your questions ready. But I, I do want to ask Zach and Ernst, the book is, a, in some ways, it is a love letter to so many of these movies that Spielberg produced and directed. The montage that we saw is heavily referenced throughout the book. But the movie made some interesting changes with that regard. So I want to ask both of you, what was the reasoning behind some of those changes, especially with regards to Spielberg's movies? Oh, that was all Steven, I mean. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, taking Steven's, uh, that was one thing he made clear at the beginning. He didn't want to directly reference himself uh, too much or pay homage to his own work, uh, which is understandable. And, you know, when people ask about uh, Steven Spielberg references in the movie, I say, well, it's a whole brand new Steven Spielberg movie, so it's all technically uh, Steven Spielberg reference. Uh, but there are references to Jurassic Park and Back to the Future, and we kind of, uh, we would sneak things in, uh, you know, even though, uh, and if he would catch them, then he would remove them, but he didn't catch all of them. So there's still uh, uh, lots of references to his movie. But as far as the changes, um, uh, the actual like set pieces uh, being changed, that was something that uh, started way back when I first started uh, writing my drafts of the screenplay, which was back before the uh, book was even published. But I could tell, you know, the whole time I was writing Ready Player One, I assumed it could never be a movie. You know, that was freeing to me while I was writing it, but I knew that to reproduce all of the stuff in the story and to get clearance, uh, you know, for everything uh, would be uh, impossible. You know, the one uh, example, and then when Warner Brothers bought the film rights, then I was forced to think of it, uh, the possibility of it becoming a movie, and I knew that there would have to be a, a lot of changes, not just because of the, the licensing, um, but also because a lot of the stuff in the book that works in the novel would not work in a movie. Like having somebody play a perfect game of Pac-Man for six hours uh, works in the book, but that would stop a movie dead. So what we wanted to do was kind of recreate uh, the, the challenges in the book uh, uh, and keep the spirit of what's in uh, in the novel, but make things more cinematic and more engaging and more kind of propulsive. So that was a, that was a, uh, an ongoing process, even for, through my drafts, and then definitely once uh, Zach uh, and then Stephen came on board, it was always making things more cinematic, but still paying tribute to the spirit of the book. But also, you know, when we had to redo, you know, Ernie and I had to redo a bunch of the clues, obviously, to fit what was there, and we kept trying to think of. I remember doing a brainstorming session where we were trying to think of references to movies from the 80s, and every time we'd come up with something, it was like, oh, geez, he, pr he produced that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he directed that. You know, every, pretty much every like, treasure thing that comes to your mind is from an Indiana Jones movie. And at a certain point, I remember saying to him, you're really ruining this movie by having made all these great movies. You're making it so hard for us. Yeah. You, you pretty much cover everything. So it did make it actually a lot more difficult to come up with good references and, and dodge Steven's giant shadow. Sean sure, Rivers. sure. So. Let's take the first question. What's your name? Hi, my name is Luis Gutierrez. Um, Mr. Ernest, I don't know if you remember, but I actually spoke to you at San Diego Comic Con this past year. Oh, hey man, good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, so my question is, is to the cast, um, what was the hardest part of immersing yourself into this world? Did you find any challenges uh, from other movies? And uh, Lena, I love you, Masters and I. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, why don't you start? Tom? All right, yeah, I'll start. Um, uh, challenge is immersing ourselves in the film. That's the question. Um, it, it, you know, you asked a great question earlier about the first time you realized uh, how like epic the scale of the movie was, and it actually for me it wasn't until we finished motion capture because we shot motion capture. All the stuff that happens inside of the Oasis came first in our production schedule. And that came with challenges in itself, but we had this great tool where ILM and Digital Domain had spent time creating these environments that we would be walking around in, in the final version of the film. And we could put on a VR headset and they were spatially tracking so that we walked around the volume and we could, we could get a sense of those environments and have a three-dimensional perspective on those. So that was super, super helpful. 
to immerse ourselves in the film. But then, you know, you, you have to, when you're ready to perform, you have to take them off, obviously. And then the room is just blank again, so you're solely focusing on the other actor uh, across from you, and, and um, which was which was fun. But you know, it was uh, so. Yeah, I guess that was the, the more challenging. How about you, Olivia? I think it's just the motion capture. I think um, it was just difficult because we'd never used that medium before, but we had two weeks where we could acclimatize to the motion capture and actually found it really freeing because you're void of any costume, any makeup, any hair, and so the, with that comes a, a sense of liberation and extra confidence, which was lovely as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think you have no choice but to just sort of go into your own oasis when you're doing the motion capture part because... <laughs> Uh, because there's nothing around you. Like, we literally had our own visors on, to, and we had to sort of use our imaginations, because, and, and obviously Steven was such a, a fearless leader in making sure we knew what was happening all around us, and saying, this thing is coming at you, okay, now you're driving really fast, okay, now Kong is about to swing a, you know, like, about to swing on the next building. So he was really great about being the maestro while we kind of just used every corner of our imagination, so that way when you see the movie, it looks like we're genuinely frightened of uh, T-Rex eating us alive while racing. <laughs> and I, I think it's actually keeping up with how fast Steven is. And because and, he actually makes up the shots when he gets there. So the way he moves his camera and all that funky stuff that he does, uh, you've got to be on point to sort of keep up with the maestro. Sure. Yeah, I think it was the motion capture that was the hardest. The room was empty, all they had were like screen assistant directors, tapes, and like poles. Other than that, there was nothing, so we had to use our imagination for everything. Yeah, uh, for me, yeah, motion captures as well. And, uh, and English language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, they taught me a lot, a lot of English, and uh, yeah, they helped me, so they're so kind. Uh, learn from the best. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have to ask. So, you're, you're, you're all making this movie, and you're all working with Spielberg. Did he ever, like, go, uh, you know, when we were doing Raiders of the Lost Ark, Harris Ford did this, or we were doing Jaws, like, the shark wouldn't do that, or, you know, we're, we're making close encounters, and, you know, Richard Trent, you know, did he, did he do that? Did he go there? Uh, yeah, yes. every five minutes. Every. Like you just hang out with him and you hear like an amazing story about him and Stanley Cooper hanging out. I remember one specific moment when we were doing a scene with Mark Rylance. We're sitting in the bedroom and Stephen has his monitor and his little headset and he's just looking at me and we're waiting, we're waiting for something. And he goes, it's not the take that takes the time to take a take, it's the time to take the take that takes the time to take a take. <laughs> what? And he goes, yeah, made that up on Jaws as we were waiting for some posters. <laughs> You know, we, would, yeah, we would always try to get him to tell his stories. I remember having lunch, you know, I would bring up Jaws, and he's like, do you want to hear how bad it was on Jaws? I'm like, yes, please tell me how bad it was. You know, and whenever you would, you would just reference a movie sometimes, and he would have a connection. Like, you would mention Scarface, he's like, oh, I shot second unit on Scarface. Or you mentioned Blade Runner. Yeah. I visited the set of Blade Runner. Of course you did. You know? Right, or, you know, I used to... We were talking about motorcycles. He's like, oh yeah, me and Stephen Queen used to ride motorcycles out in the desert. Yeah. It's like, okay, and he did. Yeah. That's what it's like having conversations with him. Yeah. Hey, you got anything like with Ben? I mean, you know, since he listens so in all, uh, so in all of you. <laughs> well, it's kind of like what happens in the Oasis stays in the Oasis, but, you know, he, he has nice. his story. <laughs> nice. Yeah, he quiz you about bloodline, is what I remember. Oh. Yeah. Uh, next question. Next question. Hi, Josh. Hi, Josh. Hi. My question is, how does the director help the cast perform on studio sets, whether motion capture or not, for any action scenes before the CG is added? That's a great question. I know that Steven mentioned that he recommended uh, hit the movie His Girl Friday uh, to these guys because the dialogue uh, is so fast. He would make, like, he would give you homework to do sometimes. Yeah, and whether you're shooting in motion capture or you're shooting in live action, Steven is incredibly engaging. And I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever worked with a director who was that into it. And like, he was, he's so much, he's such a child, like, in a great way. Like, he's, he, he's like, feels like just like a, 
film nerd and he's like, and you're that guy too. And so it's just like to have that, I think that's why you see such intimate relationships in, in his movies and camaraderie amongst young characters, not only young characters, but all characters. And watch the question. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was going to say, watching from behind the camera, my favorite thing watching Steven direct is when um, one of these guys would do a take that uh, made him happy. He would just do a little dance, like a little victory dance. Like you could tell, he was just, he's so invested in like getting, you know, getting his story. Uh, and that just, I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Next question, what's your name? Hi, my name is Russell. Uh, last year, I was in the middle of reading Ready Player One. And, um, I saw on IMDb that uh, Lena was casted and Olivia was casted, and I was so delighted. But it was spoiled for me because you're not supposed to know what these characters look like. And so for Ernie and Zach, what was your approach in revealing the cast or what the characters were supposed to look like? What, what were you doing on IMDb, dude, when you're in the middle of yeah. reading the book? Yeah. You know? your own fault. Like, if you go out looking for spoilers, you can to find spoilers. Uh, so you, here's the thing, if you've read the book, you, you know, you know what's going to happen. Um, but there's also the reality of, you know, you have these incredible actors. You know, it's different in a novel where it's all being told, you know, from Wade's perspective. But when you have these incredible actors, the idea of not having them on screen for the entire movie uh, is doesn't... It's not what you want to do. So you have to, you know, we had to pace out the reveals and choose, you know, the best place to reveal each character. But look, no matter what, we would have had to cast people and there's no way it would have gotten out <laughs> who the cast was. So you just kind of, unlike with the book, you just have to face the fact that that's what's going to happen and not just try for the surprise, but try for the, you know, the emotional core. I mean, I don't think the point of what Ernie wrote is oh look, I'm going to shock you. The, the point is, this is, these characters aren't revealed for a reason in the book, and as long as you keep that reason, you're not doing a disservice to the story. Mike. Yeah, no, and it's part of the, uh, you know, it's just part of the process of the film uh, uh, adaptation getting made of a, uh, of a popular book, and I think that's why a lot of people rush to read the book uh, before the movie comes out, is so they can have their own experience with the story without, uh, you know, that plays out in their mind's eye. But um, yeah, and we had, you know, early on in the marketing, we were trying to keep secrets but, uh, uh, about the casting, but it just became clear. We didn't know Lena was going to become literally like have the most incredible year ever that anyone star. ever had. <laughs> we didn't know that it was going to be impossible to keep a secret about her. Um, so thanks, Lena. Well, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Go win an Emmy. I apologize. It's still fun when you see us pop up in the movie, though, I promise. It's still a good time. Yeah. Uh, how excited are you by, by everything just sort of like coming coming for, for you this year? Wow. Oh man, I mean, I'm just like, you know, I'm like in my own little oasis, just enjoying it, you know what I mean? Uh, no, it's, it's phenomenal, and uh, I think to be in a movie like this is uh, really such a highlight in my career, and just to be a part of uh, the Spielberg legacy of the library, is I like to call it, I think is um, it's just a huge honor, I think, for all of us. This is also Lena's first film ever. This is true. Yeah. yeah. This is true. Wow. Yeah. 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 I will. I will also. I will also uh, offer that it's a little disconcerting when uh, you find out one of the actors cast in your movie is a better writer than you are. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Not at all. Arnie's book like really blew me away and made me want to be a better writer. So. Yeah. Truly. If you guys have not seen uh, Lena's uh, Emmy Award winning episode of Master of None, it's like the best episode of television. Thank you. You too can watch me come out of the closet as many times as you like. <laughs> Bitch on yeah. What's your name? Next question. Hi, I'm Alejandro Ozai. Uh, I a question mostly for uh, Ernest Klein. Uh, looking back when you were writing the book, is there any 80s reference that you wish you could have included? <laughs> also, um, I own a first edition and first print of your book. Oh, right and I would love to get... Oh, I got you. Oh. Oh. We'd love to get it signed. Wow. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, just, I just want to know where I can find out about your appearances so I can get it eventually signed. Uh, yeah, just on my website. Uh, yeah. Boy, oh, and there's also a... Uh, uh, well, if it's first edition, yeah, you'll have to find me, dude. 
I'm, I'm usually in Austin, Texas, but I'll, you know, I'll be around. But thank you. And, and what was your advice? Was there any uh, oh any 80s references? Yeah, you know I never made a list of 80s references when I was working on the book that I except for when I was working out the puzzles. But the, you know most of the references that kind of happened in passing in the story, I was just trying to include them organically uh, as I was writing the way that you do when you're in a geeky conversation with one of your friends. You know you make a reference uh, to a Monty Python movie or whatever just as it occurs to you, and that was what I was trying to do when I was writing. So I didn't you know but everything. Uh, that's in the in the novel is uh, something from my life, you know. Uh, I wouldn't like make a list of things. Oh, I gotta squeeze this in. So you know, it's all. But it's amazing to me that I, uh, you know, the things that I managed to leave out. I remember uh, somebody sharing with me. He's like, oh, I sh I, uh, a friend of mine, Mark Kronfelder, he gave the book to David Byrne from the Talking Heads, and he's like, oh, David really enjoyed it. And then I'm like. Oh my God, I do not mention the talking heads once in this entire book about the 80s. How did I, you know, but it's a, it's a long decade, you know, 10 whole years. So a lot of stuff to squeeze in. Next question, what is your name? Hi, my name is Kylie. My question is, what is your favorite video game? Oh, that's a good question. I will, uh, I will offer mine is uh, because it helped inspire this novel is the Atari 2600 game Adventure, Adventure. Uh, which had the very first video game Easter egg in it. And I, uh, I uh, Zach and I both found that Easter egg when we were kids, separate of each other. And, and but at that moment of finding this thing hidden by the creator of this little tiny virtual world uh, had a profound effect on me and ended up uh, inspiring this book and this movie. Yeah, normally I say Adventure, but I think. Uh, Grand Theft Auto by City. I would say FIFA because not only do I love FIFA, but we also play FIFA every day after lunch. Me, Win, and Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia. Uh, this is very unpopular, but I don't play a lot of video games, so I'll have to say Sims because I'm a pervert and I wanted to make them go woohoo. <laughs> a little old school because um, I, I used to have a Sega Genesis back in the day and um, yeah and I used to play Sonic the Hedgehog all the time. Nice! Yes yeah, Sonic the Hedgehog and the cartoon. But yeah that was my, my jam. I'm going to go with uh, Defender. Yeah. And he's good. He is good. He's quite good on Defender. I gotta give him props on that. <laughs> How about you, Philip? Uh, NBA 2K18. Yeah. Uh, Infinite Flight. It's a flight simulator. Wow. Oh. And they have great craft services on that game. <laughs> there, there's not a lot of Infinite Flight cosplay here. Right? So, wow. Yeah. Next question, what's your name? Uh, my name is Lana. Uh, so my question is, what's the funniest thing that happened on set while filming? Great question. Well, I, I got to take this one. George Lucas showing up and and uh, giving Steven an incredibly hard time about shooting digital, which he had sworn he would never do. And, and I was the only one sitting in Video Village at one point, and George Lucas comes in with his little daughter, and he's showing her around the set, but he's also saying, see, another digital camera, another digital camera. And, and I'm just sitting there. George, literally, Stephen walks over and George lays into him saying, remember you said no digital camera, what's happening now? And Stephen just starts laughing and says, George, I've used so many digital, what do you, you're still giving me a hard time about this, it's been years. But just watching the two of them, is literally like watching two like 10 year old friends, like, I told you you were gonna use that. <laughs> That's my best story ever. Right. Yeah. Who else has a good uh, well, I know that I was not there when this happened, but I know that Tom Cruise also showed up. Oh, uh, and just freaked horrendous. everybody out. I missed him. I'm pissed off. I mean, it wasn't horrendous. He's very lovely, yeah, but that Tom was Cruise. the most embarrassing. Yeah, nervous. Do you remember Ben? I do. Yeah, Ben was there. Uh, Why? You, so you get word that Tom Cruise is going to visit set, and I'm like, I'm not meeting him. It's too embarrassing. We're in our motion capture gear. I'm so sweaty. Um, it's just there's all these celebrity guests popping in. It's already nerve-wracking no, no enough shooting with Speed Steven. And so then you see Tom walk across the volume. And I literally is sinking my chair. I'm like, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. And then, and then I hear Stephen going, Olivia, um, 
can we meet my good friend, Tom Cruise? <laughs> and I just go, oh, standard. And then we walk over, and the people that I'm with run to the other end to see this interaction. I blacked out, don't remember. But apparently, I bowed like a servant. <laughs> So wow. That was the story I was going to tell. I'm glad. I was pissed off. This stuff. But I'm probably about to. We have time for one more question and more. Make more. It good. What's your name? No pressure. No pressure. Hi. Hi, my name is Adon. Uh, Holiday's first console in the book was the Atari 2600. I was wondering, what was your guys' first console? Mm. All right. Well, Atari 2600. Yeah. Uh, I'm a few years older than Ernie, so Pong. I got the original Yay! Pong. I got a GameCube for Christmas. I thought you were gonna say Xbox One. He's like, he's only. I had an, We had a Nintendo 64, but I don't remember. Okay, the GameCube is the one I remember getting. Does a Tami Tamagotchi count? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yo, man, I still remember when my dad brought home the first generation Nintendo, uh, you know, with the original square, like, handles, with the original Mario Brothers game. Um, yeah, man, it's like OG. <laughs> my sister and I spent many hours doing that, and then my mom was like, I gotta get this thing out of my house. <laughs> Yeah, I had the Pong thing too, but it had a little gun thing too. You could like, you know, little... Remember that one? Yeah. Yeah, boom, yep. boom, boom. I had a gun thing. Thing. OG. Nuts. We are the OGs. We are the original That's true. Y'all are more OG than me. Original game. Nintendo is OG. Original game. You had to blow on the... You had to blow on the, the video game to make it work. Kill the ducks? <laughs> Kill the ducks, which is like so awful. Right now. March for our lives. No guns, no guns. Even the fake ones. Hold on, Here come, here come, wait, like, uh, Halo. Are you going to Halo? Halo came out before Phil. I don't own a console, I use my PC for everything. Oh! Yeah. Control against stuff. <laughs> Alright, Wayne, how about you? Uh, yeah, uh, I was born in Myanmar, so I played Nintendo as well. The Mario Brothers? Yeah? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Nintendo. Yeah. Right, ladies and gentlemen, especially hearing all the, the discussion about, about Ready Player One, about Steven Spielberg's other movies, and seeing, again, the montage that started this presentation. You really get the scope of just how much Steven Spielberg has contributed to not just the medium of film, but of entertainment. And he's been directing movies since the early 70s, and he is, in 2018, he's still challenging himself and entertaining his audiences. Watching a new Steven Spielberg movie is like buying a brand new Beatles album. And Ready Player One comes out this coming Thursday. See it and spread the word. Thank you so much for the coming out.